The Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason University, in collaboration with the Fairfax County Community Resilience Project, and with the generous support of the Freddie Mac Foundation, we proudly present Dialogues for the Workplace. Even though my office is only about two miles away from my, our home, and I, I just uh, was very concerned if, every, if anything happened, you know, my wife and my kids are taking care of. It touched me, 9-11 and the um, anthrax, and the, because I live like maybe a mile away from Brentwood Post Office, so every time something happens, it's like I'm right there, so when the different things happen, they, you know, I don't know, sometimes I just felt like numb, because I didn't, you know, I couldn't like respond. You know, because I, I didn't really know what to feel because so many things just was happening. Everybody, they said everybody should come out to the hallway and look at the monitor. And we watched as the second one was hit. And there, there was no, I was surprised that the other lady was saying that people were hugging each other and there was comrade. There was nothing like that. Everybody was standing. It really made me think about Judgment Day because um, Judgment Day, um, in the Muslim perspective, is everybody will be naked, standing on their own, and nobody will think about anyone else because everyone's going to be scared to death. And that's how it felt right at that moment. And I could remember that after I had gotten a phone call, I went over to my gun closet. I strapped on my sidearm, and I slept with my sidearm for the next week. The uh, sniper experience in my life really freaked me out. I have to travel a lot. I'm in the distribution business in this greater metropolitan area. And I have to ga get gas two, three times a day. <laughs> I was in a meeting with the president of my company. I said, look, I'm going to work after 5 o'clock. He said, why not? I said, look, uh, John, Lincoln abolished slavery long time ago. He said he didn't mention Indians on it, so you better get that. <laughs> so, business of America is business. As That's long right. as that is there, there's nothing wrong. Yes. My idea of how we can present your views to people and um, speak out as we talk mainly about was to educate people. Especially those closest to you, and from there it would trickle on. You would educate them on your faith, on your own personality, on other people of your culture, and so that you could help end the generalization of the uh, misconceptions that people have. communities and organizations have been challenged to address complex topics. Issues around the ongoing sense of threat and concern about safety have skewed how we look at people that appear different than ourselves. Some of us have witnessed firsthand the hatred behind terrorism. Immigrant groups are finding themselves the victims of a cultural backlash. They suffer the reprisal for just being different. This country has grown powerful and strong through the efforts of our diverse populace. Our legal system continues to acknowledge and require protection and opportunity under the law for all. This program will train facilitators to address the concerns and fears that members in our communities bring with them into the workplace. Managers and human resource personnel as well as department heads and other administrative supervisors will be trained in techniques that help bring diverse cultures together and highlight common themes that concern all of us. Facilitators will learn how to guide participants in the fine art of listening and being heard. It is through these dialogues that we hope to heal our wounds and learn to understand, accept, and enjoy each other. 
Much of the footage you will see in this program was taken at actual dialogues led by professional facilitators. In an effort to discuss issues around safety and unity with diversity, the Community Resilience Project of Fairfax County and the Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason University created a series of dialogues. The dialogues you will ultimately facilitate may not be as charged as September 11th, but the techniques for understanding participants' feelings and orchestrating a meaningful dialogue are the same. Remember, where emotions are concerned, extra sensitivity is essential. Let us begin. Dialogue is a specific type of conversation where new ways of seeing and experiencing are encouraged and embraced. Facilitators are responsible for creating and then maintaining a safe space in which dialogue can occur. What does a terrorist look like? What does a sniper look like? What does a murderer look like? We don't know, so how do we deal with the community threats that we have and still make community bonds despite all of them? Let us now explore planning the dialogue. Develop the framework. What topic are you exploring and why? For whom are you putting on this dialogue? How much time will it take to address the topic? What model will you choose? Develop the questions. Make them simple and clear, provocative, and have them generate energy. Find the right location. Is the space neutral? Will participants feel welcome? Are the furniture in the room appropriate for the model that you've chosen? And lastly, create a safe space. Make sure that all the voices are heard. Encourage active listening. Get diverse perspectives. And make sure that everyone listens for deeper questions, patterns, and insights. It's been very, very strange because they're very aggressive, very militant. I have read the Quran and I never remember. We are now going to present four models. The fishbowl model. This model provides structured discussion. It is particularly useful with sensitive issues. Members can participate without speaking. In the open fishbowl model, observers can become participants by moving into the center group. They can do this by tapping someone on the shoulder or moving into an empty chair. I'm a senior civil servant. In the closed fishbowl model, Participants stay in the center circle for the allotted time. This activity allows the center group more time to express themselves. It provides the observers with a passive introduction to the topic. The sniper started, and I put on my Community Resilience Project t-shirt, and that's what I wear when I exit. I've got a big flag on the back, and then everybody was okay with me. The large group listens. The small group shares comments, perceptions, and feelings. After the fishbowl, the group breaks out to a round table and continues I on the topic. In that group more than fishbowls. On September 11, I was in Washington, D.C. Police Academy teaching the fishbowls. Another model is the round table. This model is used to discuss a topic in depth. It works best with a diverse population. Kind of more of a false church person. And I'm from Pennsylvania, or Appalachia, if you want to call it that. My name is Margie. I'm from Washington, D.C., and I live in Washington. The facilitator should encourage participation from all members, model deep listening, reinforce diverse perspectives. Yes, I don't need patriotism. I don't, I don't, I don't even like flags of any country. I, I absolutely refuse uh, to, to put up any kind of flag at any point in time of my life. Because I think if I am true to my responsibilities, wherever I am, then, then, then I'll be just fine. You know? The third model is the World Cafe. 
thinking of CAFE as a metaphor. This model generates seeds of conversation that grow as participants move from table to table. This model is good for decision-making groups, brainstorming, and sharing experiences. When you set up your world cafe, create a cafe-like atmosphere, relaxed yet intimate, like coffee houses. In the world cafe model, there is a facilitator at each table. They begin discussing the first topic with tables of six to eight participants. For the next two topics, participants move to a different table for each new topic. A facilitator remains at each table. At the end, the facilitator reports out any meaningful insights, comments, or events. Listening and talking, making a point to interact um, was another theme that came up for us. And the last comment that was made was to reach out to people that um, are prejudiced. Our final model is the buzz. This model generates discussion of similarities and differences. In the design of the buzz, pairs get together and discuss a question. In the second part, the pair joins one other pair, and they reflect on the conversations. In the third part, the joined pairs meet with four others and discuss themes and outcomes. The groups begin in pairs and can usually handle the discussions alone. In the second part, pairs join another pair for further exploration. It is in the third part where the facilitator joins the two foursomes. The group works to find common themes, turning points, and outcomes. Why don't we just start right in, uh, not with a new question, but since we're from two different groups, uh, give ourselves a sense of who the us was and who the they was in the discussions that we've had previously. Just, just a few of those, just so we can sort of understand maybe, you know, what each group was talking about. So could a few people just offer that? Mm -hmm. This final section illustrates facilitation in action. And cosmopolitanism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, under normal circumstances, the two should never mix. I mean, they're polar opposites of each other. Well, let me ask you, it, this is, some of you haven't spoken yet, so I, I'm not going to ask you to speak, but <laughs> if you want to jump in, I'd love to hear from you. It seems that there's uh, several of you at the table that are concerned about the patriot laws, about the reduction of liberty, about with the whipping up the, the drums of war uh, through patriotism, and, and uh, Donna's disappointment uh, and sad, sadness that accompanies that. Yeah. Notice how the facilitator encourages others that haven't spoken up already to participate. She also tries to pull together the themes that are emerging from the group. Whether, that's, whether that economy reverberates for anybody else, whether there's a, a sense of you, us, me, our side, and the they within this country. Mm -hmm. The government has made a staple out of that. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it's, maybe it's, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it does make it. Okay, Jerry, what were you going to say? Uh, I think it does make a difference. Um, you may not perceive it at that moment in time, I think. Yes. That's, that's the problem, that I think we all want to see something happen immediately now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's not the way the process works. It's not the way democracy works, really. Um, I mean, it, it is a slow, plodding process. Um, what I would like to do is go around the table and see who's in the room here tonight and who's at the table. So um, I would appreciate it if we could just simply introduce ourselves very briefly, if you would. We have quite a few people. Your first, first name only, please. First name only. If you don't mind. And we have quite a few people in the discussion. So what I would like is just to say what your name is and where you are currently from. And if you came from another place originally, just tell us what that is. 
but we'll save your story for, for later. I just want to get everybody kind of located. What level of detail and where we're not, from? Not, not detail. If, no, if no. You. No, I'm asking you. Are you wanting to know those of foreign origin, or do you want us to say, well, I'm from Virginia now, but I was from Illinois? Yes. Okay. I, yes, meaning <laughs> indeterminate. Okay. Yes. Where you're from now, and maybe where you identify with as your as your place of origin. How about the place that we like best? How about the place we wish we were in? <laughs> oh, let's, just, let's just do what she's asking. How about it? Let's Because otherwise, we'll never get into the conversation, right? Sometimes what a facilitator thinks is a simple request gets challenged by a participant. In this instance, her behavior kept the dialogue from getting derailed. Um, let's just try, start with that and try that, and then if people have things to add, we can add them when we tell our story. So I'm Barbara, and I live in Washington, D.C., and I'm originally from Michigan. So how does a society which believes that respond to people who believe that life is not valuable, that, that uh, you can take life as an instrument of politics and still retain what we, what we have, which is the very foundation of what our society was built on. Okay, I'm going to intervene here for a moment because I do think we can um, get involved with an ideological argument. And I think that what I'd like to do is hear from different people and learn a little bit about what your thoughts are and experiences are um, around how you feel safe or not, or what, what's helped for you. Here, the facilitator pulls the focus of the conversation back to the topic. I appreciate the views and I also appreciate the, the passion. I, I, I believe that these are important subjects and it's very, very hard um, not to go here. So what I want to do, though, is to invite us all to participate. Yeah. Give me from becoming any closer to becoming American. Mm -hmm. um, I'm from Afghanistan, and me. I usually don't get on the phone. And um, okay. Sorry. October, it's September 11th, 12, listening to the radio after the planes. I, I heard a, a well-known radio uh, announcer say to an Arab gentleman, because those people are Arab, Arabs, they're your brothers, and so you're responsible. And to me that's frightening, because as hard as we try to become a part of this culture, there's still those arrogant people who say no. Because there are evildoers out there, you're responsible, because you're, you have the same culture, you have the same religion, you have the same hairstyle. It, it's absurd. Mm -hmm. And to me, seeing the flag every day since that day, has frightened me. I can't approach people who have a flag because I can't say what I feel, mm -hmm. and I feel that they're looking at me as if I have no right to be here. Mm -hmm. and, well, and just like she, 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 she feeling is like. she finished? I'm sorry. You finished? No, I, I just wanted to say one more thing. The facilitator gently encourages this woman to express her feelings. She protects the woman's space by ensuring that she will be able to finish her statement. Um, I've, I've been in the U.S. since 82. 82. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very small when I was here, but as I grew up, um, we didn't have a choice. Of, we came here to seek freedom from the Soviet invasion. Um, and mm -hmm. as I grew up, I had, over time, I had the choice of going back. Mm -hmm. I, but I chose to stay here. And October 6th, I realized I don't, I don't feel like I belong here. I was lost once, and now it's confirmed. And but I do have to say I'm very happy with the Project Resilience and Community Resilience groups. They they allow people to come together and have discussions like this, so, so you don't feel alone. Every, almost every day I go across the Key Bridge, and then I go across the Roosevelt Memorial Bridge, and have done this for years. And I've never once. I confess, noticed a white van. <laughs> and then what happened, two or three, there are hundreds of white vans that go over. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? What happens when we call it, in fact, 
technological terms, the, the background becomes the foreground. And so what then do we pay attention to? The facilitator shares her personal experiences as a way of setting up the topic. She mentions subjects that the others in the room may relate to. She suggests common themes that may be explored later. This is dealing with issues in our culture about how we think differently about safety. That like those people who were getting together at odd, at odd hours, mm -hmm. you know, prior to September 11. Um, we have to let they, people. They came in. They came in um, to, to break see, up the cell. To, to see why. Who are you? And they, the auntie vigil. My cousin <laughs> invited them in, and he and he sat them down. Come in. This is my mom, and you know we're normal human beings. And he was. That's a funny thing, you know. After you know, the the, yeah, the, the war funny. thing, after mm -hmm. the people don't even know where it was Afghanistan. Yeah, no. that's, but this is what he really what yeah. it was really the point that you brought, I think, just yes. a minute ago that, that started this, my thinking along those lines of you were talking about the individual responsibility, and this is why yes. I asked what yes. we no, can I mean, do, and yeah. so you're talking about how do you connect with other people. Let's leave the media aside for a minute and just, you know, talk a little bit more about what do you think means to be responsible in this moment. The facilitator brings the conversation back to the original question of responsibility. She also includes all the participants in the discussion. I'm just gonna say, like, what I think I can do, like, I, this thing on a small scale, like, I think what I need to do is I need to go out and I need to try to live up to that ideal. I need to be open. Good facilitation takes practice. Every workplace offers opportunities to bring diverse voices to the table. Organizations thrive when their employees feel safe and protected at their workplace. Dialogues provide a framework particularly suited to the challenges of our times. The Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason University, with the generous support of Freddie Mac, has made this program possible. We encourage you to experience the power of using dialogues in your own workplace. As we end this training program, Let's listen to some comments about the dialogue process. An our table turned to me and said, your people did this, so what do you think about that? And before I even got an answer out of my mouth, all the other people on the table, and there was no one else from Middle Eastern culture in my table, they all said, they're not her people. So everyone on that table said that. And that really made me feel good, because it means that if I had heard her say that, in another setting where people weren't allowing themselves to say what they really think, they would have stayed quiet, she would have said that, I might have thought that they all agreed with her, but they didn't. And I would have never known that had it been a different situation. Which is not very popular. I thought dialogues are mostly for women. <laughs> and that men would not uh, be that interested in sitting and sharing feelings. So. I was surprised uh, the first time, uh, or was it the second time it uh, was in, in Herndon, when I saw so many men there and, uh, participating in a very um, uh, emotional uh, way. Frankly, when I came here for the like, multicultural the meeting, I feel like, oh my goodness, so many different people in here. I would, you know. It was some kind of different feeling, and I was not uncomfortable, but right now, I'm okay. <laughs> and then, you know, so, okay. Uh, right now, I can say, all right, we are one family in a one loop, under the one loop. Because of a multicultural dialogue, sharing different perspectives, I felt I'm accepted as I am, who I am, where I am from, and also, uh, I felt a sense of uh, togetherness. Uh, so I felt part of uh, the, the culture, part of this country, where I am, where I chose to be my country. So in a way, um, my, uh, the patriotism was evoked for me, uh, and uh, I think that was uh, a unique experience for me. The dialogues really made me in a personal way, understand how small the world has become. 
how much closer we all are together. And um, it's, it's sort of taken a, an abstract thought and made it personalized for me. Thank <laughs> you.